Oi, you're tuned in to Dry That Aussie Metal, guys, so make sure to hit that like and subscribe button so you don't miss any of his sick content. And remember, stay brutal, you legend. G'day, how you all going? It's Dry That Aussie Metal Guy here with Crank.com and with Cranium Radio. So today, tonight, wherever you are in the world, it's a great pleasure that we have ESP Engineered Society Project who recently released their latest album, Deception, which is an absolute ripper. I do have Timothy, Chris, and Jojo here. And Sean may be jumping in as well. And my co-host, Jim, of the Bloody Legends podcast. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Absolute, you absolute bloody pleasure. As we were talking there, we're talking a whole heap of Aussie rules and rugby league, which is an absolute pleasure. But first off, Timothy, I would like to know, how would you describe the, the sound and style of the band? And can you give me a little brief rundown of kind of where this all began for you, my friend? Because I believe this is the brainchild of you, mate. Yeah, well, this started for me back in 2000, and uh, several years ago, like 12, 14, somewhere in there. I was in the Middle East. And, you know, I was just deciding what to do. I didn't play music all my life. And, and I decided I'm going in a different direction, more metal, heavy metal, rock stuff. I was going to put a band together. So that was just kind of an epiphany in the Middle East. And so I came home from Jerusalem and uh, started looking for players. And over the next couple of years, we had, you know, one iteration, the first incarnation of the band. And we did one record and that, that was fine. And then the COVID, you know, COVID kind of took over. And the next thing after COVID, we, uh, the, you know, I, it was hard to keep members because they were all doing other things. And so I met Jojo and, and Jojo and I was writing material. And, and one day we said, you know, hey, we hell with these guys. We'll just go find somebody else. I have my partners out in California hook us up with uh, uh, a singer and a drummer. And it was Vinny Apathy from D.O. And, and Rip Rowan from Judas Priest. And Jojo and all of us guys, we went and cut out, cut the record Digital Soldiers. Of course, we knew that after uh, the release of that record, that Vinny and uh, Tim was going back to their full time deals. They, you know, they were gracious enough to help me, and I really appreciate it for all of the help that we had. And so we started looking for people, and we found Sean Salinas. He had been out in Las Vegas playing the Cirque Soleil shows, and he was living here in Houston. We put him in a band. And then we just put ads and feelers out all over the U.S. And, and by the grace of God, we ran into Chris. So we brought Chris to Houston and he just nailed it. And we just knew right then Chris was our guy. And so at that point, we uh, we started writing and working immediately while on that trip. And, and just a few months later, we released my TV record. And uh, that was definitely a group project. And everybody did a great job of contributing. And, uh, you know, we went back out to California and uh, did a lot of stuff with the record and they finally mixed it. We do most of our recording at Total Access in Redondo Beach and Wynn Davis and Wynn's a, like a legend in the business. The guy's done everybody that's ever been anybody. He's worked on their records and his son, Steve, they, they just do great work. So we did the My TV record. We did some shows out in California, did some shows in Connecticut, and then we went an opportunity came up for us to go to Europe last year. I'll say so we went and did 11 shows in Europe. We went to Germany, Poland, Switzerland, and Netherlands. And then we came back home and recorded the Deception album. And of course, all of this material is uh, what we see as what's going on in the U.S. right now. Um, it, you know, it is somewhat political. We don't try to be political. It's just that it's, you turn on the TV and no matter what the hell they're saying, you don't know if it's right, wrong, or indifferent, right? And it's not necessarily one group or the other. It's all of them. So that was a big influence in the record for Deception. Part of that record, um, my uh, father-in-law, you'd mentioned the situation with cancer. My father-in-law was a research scientist at MD Anderson 40 years. And his findings and discoveries have helped millions of people live all over the world. And so he, unfortunately, as he turned a little past 80, got Alzheimer's. So Jojo and I wrote a song called Fade Away. And it was one of those songs where, you know, just quite frankly, it, it wasn't in the typical uh, genre of what the band was doing, but it was what I was doing at the time. And so to spare Chris the misery of trying to do the song, we went and got Glenn Hughes to sing it. Glenn, Mr. Glenn Hughes. Had, 
And, you know, I felt like Glenn, when I wrote the song, when I started writing the song, well, I was actually at one of his shows. And I said, this guy is the guy for this song. So we, we raced and went and found Glenn and tied him up to come do the song with us. And he did. So that was, that was one of the songs on the record. The rest of the stuff pretty well reflects where we are as a band and what's going on. And like I say, we've just been so fortunate as a group. All the guys are great players. This is a great singer, great front guy. So we're just very fortunate. Oh, definitely. Um, I will, I got a couple of points out of that. I do want to um, jump on, but I will come back to that. I want to talk a little more. Um, Jojo, tell us a little bit about this collaboration with you and Timothy and kind of how you guys first met, because it kind of seems that you guys kind of connected and then you just had this kind of um, this create creative connection as well that kind of drove the band as well. Is that right? That's true. Um, originally, <laughs> I responded to like an 80s guitarist type of ad with the influence of George Lynch and, um, you know, uh, White Snake and I forgot what what the other band was. So I was like, that's totally up the alley of what I was trying to do at the time. And um, we did the same thing just like this. We were on Zoom because this was during COVID. So I didn't <laughs> we didn't want to risk it by actually meeting each other in person. So. He was like, well, just play something on the guitar. So I'm just playing and ripping. And there's a song uh, in the city where we basically came up with the majority of the parts through Zoom the first time we met. So um, I knew then that there was some chemistry between the two of us where we would be able to write anything at any time without any issues. So that's basically how it really started between the two of us. And do you think that's helped with the, the um, I know COVID was a pain in the ass, but do you think it's also helped with the, the creativity process that you're all able to connect like this when you kind of have those moments of like, man, I've got this riff, have a listen to this. And, you know, whereas before you all kind of had to meet up and kind of play the stuff together or, you know, how's that been, you know, because there has been some positives and negatives to it. Yeah, definitely. Um, at first it was us too. So, uh, I guess the foundation of the way that we write is just me and him musically with the guitars, you know, yeah. since uh, we're both stringed instruments, it just works better that way. So I would have to say it does help, but I don't think that's the best way to write. Um, it worked then yeah. and we can still do things that way now, but our ability to be very versatile in our writing with amongst each other, is i think a very strong point that we have in this latest album deception yes. showcases all of that every single song was written differently there was a different way that we presented um these riffs or even the ideas of lyrics like breathe that was a song that was lyrically done and rhythmically done with chris and sean the drummer so um this the album itself, I guess, showcases every single one of our individual styles. Yep. And versus like my TV, it's through the whole thing, it's pretty heavy. It has a very cohesive type of style. This one's just like, okay, well, you can hear a little bit of me, you can hear a little bit of Chris, you can hear a little bit of Sean, you can hear a little bit of Tim in every single track, and you can tell who's who. And I think that was what we needed to do to really understand who we are individually as musicians and coming together and see whether or not we can create something oh hell yeah and chris has this uh, amazing voice and he just kind of brings this depth to you guys as well tim ripper owens man what an amazing fucking job on that album he done man digital soldiers so you needed yeah. someone really good to come in and kind of pick up the the reins and take off from there and i believe chris has absolutely done that amazingly well and that um uh, my tv album you kind of made that and then as you said you went into the touring last year and then then making the album so i suppose that kind of all would have helped to create this amazing product yeah chris yeah yeah most and then i was definitely trying to fill some big shoes and it was so funny when we first got together we actually wrote two songs on my TV, immediately we were able to, you know, jive with each other, and that's what you look for when, when you're when you're looking for a band. You're looking for people that you can write with, and um, 
we definitely came right together and, and we're writing immediately, like the first time we got together from my TV. Yeah, and that, that must be great for you, Timothy, like to finally have this cohesive, solid unit because it is hard when you're kind of kicking off a band, you know, to have a group of guys willing to do work because it's not just rock up to a gig, play a show, get, you know, it's, you got to treat it like a, a, a job. It's an, you know, it's a profession. It's the people that are going to make it are doing that. So for creatively for you to have this cohesive unit of Jojo, Sean and Chris, just proverbially frothing at the bit to create decent bloody music and play live. It must be great for you. You know, it really is. And I tell, I, I see Jojo and Sean a lot more than I do Chris. And because uh, we were, as a rhythm section, we get together and rehearse more. Chris always knows what he's doing. So we don't waste a lot of his time, you know, fucking up the music. So I always tell him, you know, I just enjoy when we're all together playing. And when Chris comes in and we have everything good and ready and tight to go, it just works so well. And we feel so blessed and it comes out of mutual respect for all of the people in the band every one of my guys are very much a-list players in this business and could play in a lot of different bands and i just always feel so fortunate to have them and, and so we're, we're just very blessed and we, we work hard at what we do yeah definitely um definitely played in a few different bands all of you guys before you kind of started this one and you can hear the, the, the talent and the quality you guys all have. Can you tell us a little bit about how you kind of all got started? Were you a bassist first, Tim, guitarist? Yeah, no, I, uh, I came from a musical family. My mother was a church organist for like 40, 50 years, and everybody in my family played something. And I started off, you know, uh, it was interesting. I had a friend of mine played bass in a band. And he was like several years older than me, but I would go to his house and play his bass and learn his songs. And then on this one gig, he, he couldn't make it. I don't know if, you know what happened to him, but he didn't make it. And I did. I happened to be there and had his gear. And so I just played the show and kept playing ever since. I, uh, you know, it, it was just weird how that worked. And, and I grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana, and a lot of, great musicians have come out of there and played in a lot of bands and, and, you know, guys like Danny Johnson, Jay Davis, these folks were who I would go see when I was a kid and they were incredible players and it just inspired me. And, and you know, that's when I first saw Vinny when I was 16, he was playing with uh, some friends of mine in Shreveport, a band called Axis. And so that was kind of inspired me. So I had a, I was very fortunate to have a great group of people that I could look up to that were world-class players. And that just helped. You know, I don't know what happened to me, but at least I knew some good ones anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it definitely came out well for you guys. Hey, Chris and Jojo, he wants to grab it next. Um, I, I, well, you mind if I go, Jojo? Yeah, you go ahead. You're good. Um, I came up, um, my mother wanted to be a country singer. Her mother wouldn't allow her to be. <laughs> So my mother sort of lived through me, and I find a lot of my mom singing through me even sometimes. She wanted to be a country singer. And a lot of times, there's nothing I can really do. I am a song that was sung long ago. I echo in the mountains and the valley below. And it's the way it is, I have to accept it and go for the ride. Uh, I've actually even tried to get away from it. I relocated to India once in my life, and I was, like, going to go live in a cave. And... uh something in my u.s and sing and engineered society project <laughs> beautiful go for it jj uh well i mean my father plays guitar guitar i never wanted to be a musician at all that was never my my passion at all at any time growing up until um i was 13 years old i heard all along the watchtower by Jimi hendrix and when he did his little slide guitar part it hypnotized me i felt as if i understood what he was trying to say through the instrument and i've heard Jimi hendrix my whole life because my dad you know but at that point, I don't know what it was, maybe the shift in consciousness or something. 
I all of a sudden just could understand his playing. And then I became very obsessed with Hendrix. And the main thing I wanted to do was be able to convey some type of feeling and or message through the instrument using notes. That was the only reason why I picked up the guitar. And from there, I just continued down this crazy journey of learning a whole bunch of different techniques from many different players and different styles of music, mainly rock and metal. And um, yeah, it, it ended me up where I'm at now, you know, <laughs> still rocking and trying to break the barriers of music and do something slightly different. Um, I think that right there is what I'm doing mainly with the guitar in this band. Yeah, definitely. Now, can you tell us a little bit about some of the kind of people have influenced and inspired you guys as musicians and artists? Mm, I guess as a guitarist first for me, obviously it would be Hendrix and then um, Kirk Hammond and James Hetfield of Metallica to get, you know, the thrashy side and, you know, all the, the you know, just the thrash metal techniques. I really liked speed metal back then, all the stuff, you know, I noticed you're wearing Bathory. <laughs> you know, all the darker stuff, too, from Europe. Um, and from there, I just kept going into more crazier metal. But I always enjoyed, I guess, psychedelic-type music, like Pink Floyd and, and Genesis, like early Genesis and um, uh, King Crimson, stuff like that where it's very proggy. Yep. So in my mind, I guess naturally how I write is to incorporate these metal techniques, but try to paint a huge broad picture with the music versus it just being very, um, I guess, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge type thing. You know, um, that's how we write. But how can we write using pop music structures, but it's still have some type of heaviness to where you can feel like you're going somewhere with the music and it's not just cliche. So for me personally, those are the things that shaped the way that I play and also how I write. And then having those hooks, as you kind of just mentioned, you know, the, those hooks and telling that story through the music, it's just, yeah, unreal, man. Cool, Tell cool, me. man. Thank you. Ah, uh, Cool, you guys. Jump up, Tim. Tell us a little bit about some of your influences. And I kind of do want to touch. I, I, I mentioned, like, you guys all talked about family. Um, for me, that's also always a big influence. People do forget about that. That kind of builds your early musical start. You mentioned Genesis and Jimi Hendrix and bands like that. And I was listening to stuff like that growing up, Crowded House, Hoodoo Gurus, Sting, David Bowie, and that kind of created the the person i am too musically you know influences are always i think the home the early musical memories as well kind of as you grow up and what you're listening to it does create us who we are and then that grows into our own influences that are kind of you know from that youth and that childhood that that good time when you first start having those early musical memories, you know what I mean? Listening to mom sing in the kitchen or cooking or things like that, you know, or going around to your grandparents and hearing what they're playing. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. When I was a kid, it was not uncommon on a Friday night for my mom to have musicians come over. And these were guys that, you know, fairly accomplished musicians play and you know like guitar players and my dad was a drummer my mom played keyboards and you know it, things like that it, it it happened from time to time and it was I guess for me I didn't realize that it was any different I just thought that was the normal and so music has always been a big part of my life and you know everything I've ever done and went to see and you know back from when we rehearsed when I was a teenager in the Union Hall in Shreveport the people that were there very good players that went far in the business so it was that's just all i've ever seen and known you know i uh i, I don't know any different i guess so yeah, that's it work your <laughs> nine to five then go make music that's kind of the struggle that musicians are under at the moment hey? yeah. yeah i i had to take a lot of lessons man i had to i took opera lessons i took many many singing lessons because my Becoming a singer for me came from punk rock. Um, I basically moved to a place called New Haven 
and there was a a new thing that was out and i i got together with these people and i felt like we were in the world by being punk and being hardcore and i really got into it so my position ended up being a singer it's interesting to hear jojo talk about not being he didn't know he's a musician i didn't really know i was a singer i basically was a punk rock sort of group and i ended up always being like the singer of the punk band and 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 punk was definitely not singing it was like speaking about what we were into we wanted to change so when i sort of evolved i had to take a lot of lessons to learn how to sing because my main position was more speaking about you know things that i'd seen or, or you know talking punk is more like talking compared to singing so i've had to really catch up with my motivation because it all comes from punk and hardcore yeah exactly and um punk and hardcore has always come from a place of um well, some bands, but um, it used to uh, be like a very political. I know a lot of bands are still doing that. It's always got something to kind of a message behind it as well. That's another reason I always bloody love punk. I love all metal and bloody. I grew up with a lot of punk and hardcore and sick of it all and bands like that. But also, I do want to, speaking of punk, it just hit me. You guys released the um album Deception the same day you were playing on Milwaukee Metal Fest, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How how was that, guys? To to kind of drop the album the same day and play on the the Milwaukee Metal Fest, and that's the one that Jamie um just has taken over and been putting on for the last couple of years, yeah. Jamie yeah. Josta is very good, and, and and I've known Jamie Josta. Jamie Josta was actually in a band that used to open up for my band, and um the funniest thing in my history of music is that he was in a band called Josta Fourteen, and they kicked him out. So literally think about that years later, one of the most influential and together you talk about the Milwaukee metal fest, Jamie puts on a festival that is so organized, that is so together, has such supportive people. The Milwaukee metal fest, we, we've done it two times now. It's just, I'm so proud of my friend who's come so far and is so influential in the scene. Now Jamie is, Jamie's the man. Oh, he most definitely is, dude. I um fucking massive hate breed fans. Actually, one of my emails, man, hate breed three sixty, dude. Fucking absolutely. Um, I love that man. He does some great things. It must be it, also good, kind of having, I suppose, him putting it on and from a musician's perspective as well, because you see, like people like, for example, like running digital platforms like that, bald headed can't run on Spotify at the moment. He's not a musician. He has no understanding about music, and he's just like. You know, whereas someone like Jamie Jaster is a musician and is thinking about the bands and doing it from a place of love. You can kind of see the bloody differences, I eh? Most definitely. Yeah, the results yeah. were in the festival because it's so well run. It's a first-class situation and all of the bands are treated well. I mean, obviously, we we are treated like royalty and, and it's like we're some of the lower rung of the bands as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you had, you know, who did we see? We saw... Hammerfall and who else? I mean, some of these incredibly big bands and they treat everybody fantastic. And it's just a real class situation. We're so fortunate to be a part of that. Yeah, absolutely unreal. Tell us about the track Fade Away there, Tim, and ha how you managed to get Mr. Glenn Hughes on it. Um, you did kind of touch on that track before, but that, that that's an amazing track, man, and a, a great ode to, you, to your father. Yeah, there. well, uh, you know, it's a it's kind of a long story and there's a lot of people involved and I don't want to say too much about it. I, I met Glenn in 2019 in New York City and um, you know I've always been a big fan of Glenn and I remember when he was in trapeze and all that. So you know I've known of Glenn ever since I was 15 years old and I've listened to a lot of his stuff and when the situation came up, when we were in California about the song saying, well, you know, who would you want to get? And the, the partners and stuff that I work with, they, I told them, and you know, uh, it's a small circle of people that know people. And, and they were able to get word to Glenn and his management that, that we would, you know, hope he would entertain uh, coming and do the song. And, and with, a uh, you know, 
basically we were able to work everything out to fit his schedule because as soon as Glenn, Glenn sang the song when we were in Redondo together on my birthday in January, and then like a week later, he started to tour and he's, hell, he's still on tour. I, you know, Glenn's just an incredible, incredible stamina and person and singer and genuinely just a super nice guy. And so I was very fortunate to have our people that we get to work with, work with some of his people to make that happen. Yeah, dude, it came out really well. Hey, guys, have you got a favorite track off the album? Oh, look, I hate doing it because it's like picking a, a child and it changes from week to week as well. I, I, I'm a whole album kind of person, so one week I'm loving one track and another. But for this week, tell us what track you're uh, digging off the album and why. You going to start with me? <laughs> Whoever, guys. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I'll uh, go. Do, I, you know, for me... Um, I have to say one of my favorite tracks on the record is Who Am I? Uh, that's a song we were in the studio and quite frankly, we had this one tune and it just wasn't working. And so I said, well, guys, we're sitting here in this fantastic studio that we're paying an enormous amount of money for and we need another song. So Jojo, let's write another song. And sure enough, me and Jojo started writing and, and we, we kind of firm, you know, got some music together with Sean and everything was going good. And then Chris just came and dropped a fucking incredible melody and lyrical uh, work on this song. And I thought, oh, my God, we were sitting in the control room listening to it and says, wow, what an incredible job, Chris. Way to go, buddy. And so it just worked. And, and it, you know, for me personally, the lyrics kind of reflect sometimes how I feel. And it's uh, that's the cool thing about being in this band with these guys is sometimes we're just all on the same page, regardless if we want to admit it or not, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but that that's that's probably one of my favorite songs on the track. Oh, yeah. Please what do like you got, that. Jojo? I'm still talking. I'm still trying to figure out. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's a it's a. It's a tie between Deception and Who Am I, I think. Um, because Deception, that song, it took a little while to get that one together, but the majority of that was written by Tim. Um, all I did was help him clean up some of the pieces and structure it. <laughs> but all that is Tim's thinking. And that very much surprised me because I, I wasn't expecting him to come out with something so heavy. So um, that's when every time I listen to it, I'm like, wow, this is Tim's writing because I'm pretty sure the lyrical content and also the the the, the vocal melodies were him as well because it sounds like it. So I was like, damn, this is a Tim song, and it's it's just awesome the way it's put together. I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting to be a little bit more experimental with this album. And then all of a sudden there's that. And also, Who Am I? It's structured quite the same. I think it has a very similar impact. There's awesome vocal melodies, and that's all Chris. That's Chris's lyrics and Chris's vocal melodies. And same thing here. I think the, the opening riff is what Tim came up with, and I thought it was too technical. If we would have went down that road, we would have went and created some crazy heavy songs so what i tried to do is pull back as much as possible and that's where the verse and the the uh, chorus comes in which is the who am i so it's a lot more cohesive and then all of a sudden it goes heavy with the dun, 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 you know and that's tim again going crazy so i look the main reasons why i like those songs is not only do they sound amazing the backstory behind them and how they came together, I think is amazing. So every time I listen to these songs, I'm like, wow, these are awesome. But I'm also proud of the guys for being able to bring something so memorable to where it makes me feel a certain way as a listener. Even though I'm on it, I still feel like, oh, wow, I'm just listening to these guys create magic. And I'm just kind of in the background bullshit. <laughs> I want to say where Jojo doesn't take enough credit. I wouldn't be sitting here right now if it wasn't for Jojo. 
And I can tell you everything that we do, he has a huge part in. And I may come up with a lick, but it's after me and him has been jamming and doing so many things. And I always tell him I would have never come up with that had you not been here. So, Jojo, I named him our Minister of Quality Control. At the end of the day, <laughs> as the final say over all music that we do, because my contribution is more like I'll write something fucked up and say, Jojo, now will you fix it? <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth, and I want yeah. JoJo. You know, I ain't letting him off the hook. He's very much, very responsible for what we do, and so is Chris. So, so where I come from with this thing is, I had. A, I'm, I'm glad these guys went first because I, I'm still sitting here <laughs> thinking about it. I, my favorite song is a tie. It was a tie. It was between Who Am I and Prophet to the Fire, but it leans more because the two these two guys have spoken about the other song. The reason, the reason behind liking Prophets of the Fire is because it's sort of like what's going on with us right now. Um, the Prophets of the Fire, my nickname used to be the Prophet of the Fire. And what I'm doing with Prophets of the Fire is, you know, I, I'm putting together um, with a bunch of different bands, you know, and I want to drop a lot of names. I basically want to say other bands' names because I really want, um, I've been getting together and we've been talking about unity and we've been talking about sort of burning the old way down. And that's one of the lines in Prophets of the Fire, burn the old down, burn the old down. And the idea of your band going in, doing your thing and then getting out of there. Well, we're sort of I'll name some of the bands. We're playing the Viper Room in Hollywood. June 21st, we're playing with Stephen Carroll. We're playing with Safrau. We're then moving over to Las Vegas. We're playing with uh, Scum Love, L.A. Story, Shatter the Moon. And there's one of the band I, I forgot and I have to look it up. But then the band that's really been igniting, putting a fire under my butt is a band called Dirt. They've been reaching out to me and really talking about unity between bands. And they, they, they made a hashtag, Metal Bands Unite. So what I'm doing, I'm reaching out through the prof Prophets of the Fire is I'm saying burn the burn the wave down of you know ununity and try well, I want to do that I want to say you know we unify together and we're much stronger together so that that's the why I would like I would put it's close for me though I I that, I feel like Tim about who am I I think uh, at first I really I'm gonna be honest I actually was pissed off in the studio because I was like we can't do this here we can't do this now and then literally. The band changed my mind, and with a little fire under my butt, once again, I went back to my hotel room, and I went, God, I, I, and I sat there, and in my sleep, I wrote it at about three or four in the morning, and it was going, who am I? And I had to get up at this, you know, four o'clock in the morning and write it down, and then you get back to the studio, and that's sort of what you live for. You live for those creative situations where maybe you're pushed a little bit by your comfort zone, and also you open yourself up like Jojo has been talking about to creating something that we don't even know what it is where we're four, you know, artists that are getting together and allowing each other to express ourselves through art. Oh, damn straight. Fucking great message there. Killer track as well. That was actually the last track I listened to because I played the, I always play whole albums. People don't forget to play the whole bloody album. And I uh, listened <laughs> to that one just before I uh, jumped in there. And it's a great message too, because unity is bloody important. You see this division, especially in the, the hard rock and heavy metal scene for some reason. I don't, I really don't understand it sometimes. I think we need to be stand together and not have this division. So unity, like looking after each other. And even like, it comes down to the, the fan going to concerts, like doing the right thing by each other. The scene's been changing a lot where it has been, you know, looking after each other. Unity has been the str the stronger message going forward. Not being an arsehole kind of is, you know, a big one too as well. And um, I believe that, you've hit the nail on the head. We do need to look after each other and the metal scene isn't big enough for us to start fucking ripping each other down and fighting against each other. That's for sure. We do need to be lifting each other up. Yeah, well, That's interesting that you say that. My bad. Uh, it, by you saying that, I saw a lot of that at the Milwaukee Metal Fest, both 
I saw the unity and I also saw the separation. And a lot of it came from the styles of metal. Because you had power metal, you had thrash metal, you had death metal, and you had, there weren't any black metal in there, but, you know, so when you have these different types of metals, you would think because it's under the umbrella metal that it's all the same, but it isn't. And I won't ever forget, I was watching Symphony X, and there's this guy in front of me, and he has all these patches of thrash metal bands on his on his um, jacket. And I'm like, okay, cool. I don't think he's going to like Symphony X. And this guy's singing every single lyric with his hand in the air. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. And I'm a pretty big Symphony X fan. And he knew, like, all the lyrics and stuff. I'm like, wow. But there was a couple right next to him that was looking at him with disgust and looking at the band with disgust and looking at everybody like, what is this? What is this band? Why are they like them? And eventually they just walked off. But I was watching everything, you know, and, and to me, it was weird because, like you said, it's it's all metal. It might be a little different in sound, but we're all there for the same reason. You know, we all love heavy metal and we're, we're coming together and just trying to express ourselves or find unity within, you know, how did you come across this band? Oh, I came across this band this way. And then you end up becoming buddies because y'all like very similar styles of metal. But that thing won't ever leave my head. It just sits there. So by you saying that, I'm seeing this in my head again. I'm like, wow, I'm the one guy I thought who wouldn't really like it was knew everything. And the the couple that I thought and probably would like it freaking hated it. I've seen and that all the them. time too, Jojo. Yeah. And it does get on my grinds on my gears a bit. And I've, I've actually, funny enough, I watched um just a little quote from Kevin Smith talking about um basically that he had nearly heart attack, nearly died, had a mental breakdown, and that he would rather spend his time talking about things he loves and not what he hates. I, I love music. I love music in general, dude. I've chatted to everyone from, from Mr. Al Anderson of Bob Marley and the Wailers to Prince's godson to, to, to just about everybody. And I love music as a whole. And um, just because I don't understand a band or a musician's what they're trying to portray doesn't mean somebody else isn't going to get that or at their, that time of their life, or it's not going to mean something. So why should I tear down somebody else's vision or what somebody else will get from it? Just because I don't understand it. I would rather talk about what I love and just go, I love the music and just keep going on about, you know, the scene in general. I love what bands like yourself, the messages can portray, you know, how you can reach fans. I just, all, all of it, you know what I mean? I would rather spend my time talking about that than a negative. Cause it did, it did hit me. You know what I mean? Cause I went through, as we were talking before we went on Mike, I went through my own struggles last year. I'm in remission from cancer after multiple months of chemo and radiotherapy for me. I would rather support the scene and just go on about the positive side of it instead of the negative. And it does get my goat a bit when I see bands going on on Facebook or you see them all the time with their keyboard. Oh, bah, 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 I don't like sleep token. I don't like <laughs> ring me the heart. That's not fucking metal. It's like, don't listen to it, dude. But like bands like sleep token and bring me the horizon, and their latest album are pushing these elements. And you were talking about having these pop, influences like bring me the horizon started as a deathcore band now are a pop yeah. band with these metal influences and they still have this great sound where sleep token are this amazingly progressive band that have these real heavy elements i've seen them a couple of times fucking absolutely dig it they do bring in these little pop elements but have a great sound and then people sit there tearing it down because they don't understand it i i can't fucking get it and i really don't understand it as i went on my little yeah. rant sorry people no <laughs> uh, i understand yeah. I understand. Uh, awesome, guys. Uh, I you think still it's have... always been there. Uh, it definitely has been, dude. But people need to start pulling their head out of their ass a bit and fucking, you know, just moving on, people. I think some people have too much of a platform. You were talking about some shows. I have got a poster. I just want to quickly share, guys. Sorry. Um, so everybody can have a little look at what you've got on there. Um, right. you have played the Milwaukee Metal Fest. There we go. I'm a nice pick of you guys as well. Um, you did mention the Viper Room on June 21st. You have the July 5th one at the Black Magic Social Club, the Whiskey A Go Go, July 11th, 
July 20th um, over in Las Vegas, Fort Worth, Texas is at the Rail Club. July 26th, got a heap of shows on, man, but I do want to discuss the European tour. What was that one like last year? Mm -hmm. so, so biggest thing that's going on is um, the Viper Room. We're actually filming a scene for a movie there, and it really it, it has that under of uh, metal bands unite because I'm trying, I'm calling, I'm reaching out to my friends who I used to play. I used to play in a band called Die Bomber and I used to play on the Hollywood strip all the time. So I'm reaching out to all my old friends and saying, come down to the Viper Room, be in a scene. It's actually a feature film. It's Arthur Springer's new movie called Dark Alien Visions. And uh, we, we right now we're really trying to um, reach out and, and show this unity through having like some of uh, our friends appear in the movie. Jojo, tell them about the tour. I think you're about uh, to talk. Yeah, I was just reminiscing a little bit. <laughs> um, it was, it, it's very much different. I think Europe is very much different from here. Um, I think there is a lot more of unity when it comes to the heavy metal, hard rock scene or just in music in general. They very much do appreciate what you do, either though they might not know who you are and what in the world you're bringing to the table, but they just enjoy music and live performances, especially if you're just giving it all to them on stage. Um, and yeah, I think my favorite spot was, uh, I think it's called Pamela's Rock Bar or something like that over in um, tour in Poland. That was a very... That was a surprise. I wasn't expecting that place to be packed like that because it was empty and out of nowhere they opened the doors and it just got flooded with people. Like, oh, what's going on? And yeah, we we laid it all on on stage and there's some awesome photos. Um, I don't know. There's just so much to talk about, you know, with Europe. But those those are the and, and Hildburghausen in in Germany. It was a little small little club. But the people there were truly loving what we were doing because they were locals. Like it's interesting. There's like this little club in this little town, and everybody just walks to the venue and they're like, "Okay, there's these American band. You know what's going on? And, you know, and they're buying us drinks and just very interested in where we're from and they want to show us around. And it was it was more like they were accepting us into their their community. And I've never felt anything like that before in my life. So it was, it made me feel like I was very much appreciated for what we were doing, either though they had no idea who we were. And that was a level of appreciation I've never experienced and I would like to experience again. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really great scene over there in Europe. And I know a lot of Aussie bands are frothing to get over there. I think most of the bands and most of the world, if you're not in Europe, are really want to go over there because as you mentioned, they do have this unity and acceptance of heavy metal and heavy metal music in general, you know what I mean, compared to where we are, you know, it's kind of the down here below the the, the pop and the hip hop <laughs> sort of and everything yeah. as, as well. So when you do get over to Europe and have those fans that really, you know, get behind it as well as the shows, I think a lot of, um, I know your scene's probably the same, a lot of people in local areas need to get behind the shows when you are there, not just these big bands that are coming in, but also your local scene too. You like get along and support bands that are coming through because without a good, strong local scene, you're not going to have these big bands come because they're just going to miss fucking where you are. Yes. Uh, we're actually focusing on that right now. We have a show July 5th and we're really networking with the other bands on the bill and, and basically creating that unity and I, I love dropping names where we're, we're connecting with scroll keeper savior skin frank and christ and um the filthy dead i think is the other one and really yeah. been out with them and saying and sort of like declaring it in our own town you know we're i mean in our own state houston is that you know we have this just we're talking to you we want to come out and play around your way we want to talk to you about that we are an national band but we are we're going to be establishing some big stuff in our hometown and, and we're doing it because we're getting this energy from these bands that we're networking with that are feeling the same there that we're, that we're feeling ah oh, damn straight I, I think it's safe to say i mean 
I handle the logistics and the planning and the negotiations for the band. And right now we are in negotiations to go back to Europe and we left open October, September, November, pretty open in case some of these things may work out. But it is important to us that every show we go to is, is to play it as the best show we could ever be because that's how you make fans one at a time. And, and it's so important to, to do your best every night. And these guys, I mean, my guys, they do that. And, you know, I can't wait to play in Houston because even though we're from Houston, this band has only done one show in Houston in this iteration. We've been, you know, we've played more in Hollywood and, and all that. And it's like, I want to come home and build a fan base. And it just takes time. And, you know, there's just so much to do and so little time to do it. And it, it all takes so much discussion and money and everything. The, the music business is tough right now all over the world. And there's, you know, there's a, for every club, there's a million bands trying to get in there. And a lot of them are very good. You know, we've seen and heard a lot of great talent all over the world where we go. And so, uh, you know, we're going to do our best to play as many shows as we can and be the best we can be every night and keep turning out songs and, you know, just doing what we do and hope that, uh, you know, people are digging what we're doing and coming to see it. And that's a key part of being in a band these days, isn't it? Like you've just got to keep playing shows because fucking unfortunately the state of the scene at the moment, you create an album, you drop it out you go, there you go people. And everybody just, except my day we used to go buy albums people you buy vinyls and i know there's still we're, we're lucky in the metal scene that we're, yeah. we're, we're crazy like that that we still do it and that's an unreal thing i think supporting a band buying albums going along to a show means so fucking much you know what i mean like i love going to these local shows and i don't drink alcohol so i'll go there and fucking easy buy a hundred couple hundred bucks worth of merch walk away go an, an <laughs> album and talk some shit to the dudes behind the merch stand because it's usually you guys sitting behind the merch stand selling merch after the show before the show you know what i mean playing countless shows just to be able to fucking make a mutt enough to make another album because these are all bloody work and day jobs as well. That's what people don't understand. I was talking to someone the other day and they're like, Oh, why don't the band do this? Or people, I'm like, nobody's getting fucking paid because nobody wants to go support the scene at the moment. They think, Oh yeah, it's not Spotify. I'm doing my fucking bit, but I don't, I, I don't know. I think support is everything. <laughs> fans need to remember going and buying albums, like grabbing the Deception album, you know, supporting you guys where you can. Yeah, listen to it on Spotify, stream the crap out of it, but go buy it if you like the fucking album. Nothing wrong with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to men mention an individual who has this down to a science. I was in a band with him, and he actually is the president of our uh, label, Combat Records, Mind Snap Music slash Combat Records. His name is Christian Lawrence. He goes by the name, the moniker Opus. And this guy goes to everybody's concerts. He basically is such a supporter of original music. He was actually a big influence on my life. He actually, he really showed what you're talking about. He not only was in his own band, Dead by Wednesday, but he was at your show. You'd actually see him at your show. So doing that really makes a difference. And then really, you know, you have to have those people who supports your issue. You know, basically we're getting up and we're saying we are engineered society project. Who's down with us? Who's coming with us? And really, but really the bands and even podcast people are like behind the scenes with us, supporting the energy of what we're trying to do here. And we're, we're grateful with everybody and for everybody. And we really want to start implementing that through our promotion through our marketing. And one way we're going to do that is um, we're doing a music video. Um, we're doing a music video, which is going to be a trailer for Dark Alien Visions at the Viper Room, June 21st. So literally, sort of the theme of Deception, really, I think Tim really hit it on the, na hit it on the nail with what's going on right now. I mean, we're in the middle of... Tim was saying, you don't know when you're, you, you're tuning in and you're looking at this stuff that's happening in our society, you're going, I don't know, man, everybody's screaming these different things. And I think a lot of people feel the same way. But we really want as many heads as possible to come out and be in our video. So when we put our new, our brand new video out 
for this uh, this movie and this brand new CD. We want to see your face in there so we can uh, we we can show that unity with our Hollywood uh, with our Hollywood people. There you go, people. Get along to the Viper Room. Be there for Engineered Society Project. Guys, look, this has been an absolute pleasure. I could bloody talk all morning, but I'm going to let you guys go with some last words, uh, shout outs, and thank yous. And anything else you'd like to add in there, my friends? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> add that. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Mom. We've got to go. It's that, our getting in touch with us, man. If you see this right now, uh, you can get in touch with us. Our name is very unique. It's Engineered Society Project. And um, we're on all platforms distributed by Von Artists. You can see us. If you just type in Engineered Society Project, pretty original. And also like on Instagram, we're Engineered underscore Society underscore Project. If you go on Facebook, the best way to hit us personally, we can get right back to you, is Engineered Society Project street team but we also have a page so basically it's really about getting at us if you see this podcast get at us talk to us if you're in another band and you feel the same way about unity hit us up man we're actually traveling in that list that uh, our boy showed you basically we're going to be traveling all over the place probably back um over in europe at the end of the year and i'm very serious we uh, as such a this has been such a positive uh podcast we we definitely possibly have australia on our mind man i mean you you have a great energy thanks for having us, man. absolutely Let's do it yeah thank you for having us for sure absolute pleasure tim jojo do you want to chuck anything mate <laughs> uh, with, with slight trepidation <laughs> yeah i'm the shy one um i usually just i'm in i'm like 100 percent just crazy solo in my own zone musician type guy but when we meet in person that's where i let it all out but i mean there, there's so many people i could shout out but i just very much appreciate you for doing this because it really does open not just our eyes but me personally that there are people all over the world who do understand the importance of what we do as artists and also music and the ability to express ourselves and also just come together and really enjoy each other's company because there are similar things that we like. And to me, that's just true friendship. So I would like to thank you for having us on. And I can't wait until we do actually do this again or actually meet in person, you know? <laughs> damn straight be great get engineered society project down under everybody go out grab some music from these guys the latest album deception did drop may 17th everybody chuck it in the stereos crank it up really bloody loud the neighbors are going to want to hear it too cheers guys thank you, thank you. Oi, you're tuned in to Jive That Aussie Metal Guy, so make sure to hit that like and subscribe button so you don't miss any of his sick content. And remember, stay brutal, you legend.